Machiavelli's The Prince is one of the most important turning points in the history of Western political philosophy. It was written while Machiavelli himself was in retirement from active political life, 1532. And prior to that, he had worked for the Medici family in Florence. And he was one of the great dark characters in the history of Western thought. In some respects, he's kind of like the Darth Vader of philosophy. He represents all that is evil and unholy. In some respect, the spiritual antipode of someone like Marcus Aurelius. Machiavelli is a this, very secular, this-worldly sort of thinker. He's the kind of person that Plato warned us about. The kind of man who self-consciously seeks only the gratification of his desire for political power. A man who turns ruthlessness and treachery into matters of principle. And that's what makes him so good at them. It doesn't, it's not that he's treacherous or lying or faithless or ruthless once in a while. He's that way all the time. He's turned it into a system. In that respect, the writings of Machiavelli, which are not limited to the prince, he also wrote a number of historical works, uh, a work called The Discourse on Livy. He studied Roman history a great deal. Machiavelli's works are kind of handbook on how to be bad, particularly how to be politically treacherous, how to gain power. For Machiavelli, the ultimate good for human beings is the attainment of political power, and he is not choosy about the means. Whatever works, works. He is among the most practical of men. His idea of an, of an excellent politician is someone like Caesar Borgia. Caesar Borgia is mentioned many times in the Prince, and if you know what Caesar Borgia was like, he has a quite an interesting career. His father is Pope Alexander VI. We won't discuss how, how that could be the case, of course, but he's the illegitimate son of Alexander VI. Um, his sister is Lucrezia Borgia, a most unpleasant woman who spends a good a bit of her time poisoning their friends and political rivals. And uh, Caesar Borgia was the sort of guy who wouldn't let mere family ties get in the way of political power. His older brother was the one who was destined or chosen by the father, Alexander VI, to get most political preferment, and Caesar Borgia didn't like that, so he killed his older brother, conspired against him, and killed him. Machiavelli thinks that's wonderful. Machiavelli says that warms his heart, makes him feel that finally somebody sees through the lies and the illusions and the pretensions of conventional morality. For Machiavelli, we live in the jungle. We live in a totally amoral universe, independent of scripture, independent of revealed religion, independent of the will of God. There's only the will of man. In that respect, Machiavelli is a path-breaking political philosopher, no matter how evil or pernicious his teachings. We ignore him at our peril. And like it or not, there is a dark and sparkling brilliance to this, like black diamonds. You look at it and you realize that however horrifying his conclusions there's a certain grim truth in what he says, and we may not accept the entirety of it, but like it or not, the world of politics is an ugly, profane, immoral place, at least to a great extent. And those of us who wish to be practical politicians will find it very hard to keep our hands completely clean. Machiavelli wishes to liberate us from what he views as being childish, insipid guilt feelings about political morality. There are no rules in politics in the same way and for the same reason there are no rules in nature. With Machiavelli, we have one of the great restatements of a political theme introduced in Western political thought in the first book of the Republic. If you stretch your memory back to Professor Ricuti's lectures last time, when he talked about the Republic, in the first book of the Republic, Socrates' primary antagonist is a man named Thrasymachus. He's a sophist, and Thrasymachus holds the view that justice is the advantage of the stronger. In other words, whoever it is that has the most force, the most military power, makes the rules. And justice is whatever they tell you to do. So when the Nazis win, whatever they tell you to do is just. If the Stalinists win, whatever they tell you is just. If Machiavelli wins, or the Borgias win, doesn't matter, as long as they have the power to coerce you, whatever they tell you is just. Thrasymachus' view, then, is that justice is a simple matter of coercion, and there is no moral order to the world. Now this view is thoroughly criticized and at least apparently refuted in the first book of the Republic. But 
like all profound ideas, resonance of it is always, at least implicitly, in the Western political tradition. And Machiavelli regains the nerve to say there is no moral order to the world. He's the first man to reassert what Thrasymachus said in the first book of the Republic, that we live peculiarly and exclusively here in the realm of nature, that there is no metaphysical realm by which to judge the good and evil of human actions. There's only power, force, brutality. You adjust to it or you succumb to it. Those are your choices. Machiavelli wants to teach us how to become tyrannical men. And if you stop and think about the first book of the Republic, I believe you will recognize that Thrasymachus has the tyrannical soul, the soul that's driven entirely by passion, that thinks reason is something, is an afterthought for the feeble who want to make up stories about why we ought to be good rather than evil. Machiavelli and Thrasymachus both wish to liberate us from metaphysics and morality. Both of them say, in this world of darkness, flux, double-crossing and backstabbing, the only way to get ahead, the only way to achieve human felicity, human happiness, human goodness, is to get them before they get you. Donald Trump recently wrote a book called The Art of the Deal. You could say that Machiavelli's book is the art of the double cross. He not only explains how to be treacherous, he gives you examples. He calls them from history, he calls them from contemporary politics as well. But in every case, he shows that crime not only pays, but that goodness is a waste of time and goodness will ultimately be your downfall. In some respects, Machiavelli's pro project is like that of Friedrich Nietzsche. It'll be a revaluation of all values. He's going to stand the Christian and the Platonic view of righteousness, of political morality, on its head. All the things that we'd previously thought to be good turn out to be evil. All the things that we previously thought to be evil turn out to be good, or if not good, pleasurable, practical, useful, handy. Machiavelli has written a number of works. The Prince, which is his most famous work, is a remarkably brief piece of work. Usually when a great philosopher has some important message to give, he can't control his pen. And if you look at, say, Aquinas' Summa Theologica, it goes on and on and on. It's interminable. Machiavelli has not written that sort of a book. It's a 90-page book, in and out. It's meant to be a practical handbook for the tyrant. Machiavelli's book, The Prince, was Joseph Stalin's favorite work. He kept it on his night table. And it's not hard to see why. It shows you how to be a good tyrant. A good in the sense of effective, good in the sense of practical, not good in the sense of morally good, because that's only for old ladies and kids. Nobody seriously believes that stuff. Now, this may sound like a very cynical set of ideas, and in fact it is. But although it is very cynical, there is an element of it which is practical, which is true, like it or not, if you are completely good, completely virtuous, I am not certain that you will be a completely effective and efficient politician. I don't know that I want the president to be as kind and as thoughtful and as philosophical as Marcus Aurelius. Maybe we would be harmed as much as benefited by that. I am sure, on the other hand, that I don't want the president to be like Machiavelli's prince, because it's a sure thing we will be harmed rather than benefited by that. Prior to going into seclusion and writing this book, Machiavelli had worked for the Medici family in Florence, who were influential figures in Florentine and thus in Italian politics. And although he had been serving them and helping them out and advising them on political matters, the Medici's had been thrown out of Florence, had been chased out, and with them goes Machiavelli. He goes into retirement. Now, there's a definite sense here that here's a man who's very intelligent, very bright, but awfully frustrated. He gives you that sense when you read the book of being a Monday morning quarterback. God, how he wants to go back into there in practical politics. He hates being among the musty books in the library. It's not interesting to him. What he primarily wants is to run people's lives. What he pr primarily wants is political power. And after he gets political power, what he wants then is more political power because you can never have enough. As Socrates pointed out about the tyrannical man, this is a thirst that can never be slaked. No matter how much satisfaction you get for these desires, nothing is ever enough. You're like someone that can't get enough to eat or can't get enough to drink. No matter how much you eat or drink, it's never satisfactory. So here's one of the great dissatisfied individuals, and he's even more dissatisfied because he's forced to be an armchair quarterback, and no one is more practical than Niccolo Machiavelli. He dedicates his book 
to one of the Medici family, and it's one of the most flowery and flattering and adoring introductions one could possibly imagine. And of course, it's no less cynical than the rest of the book. The book itself tells the wise prince, the monarch, the he who would be tyrant, that he must be very careful to avoid flatterers because flatterers are dangerous men. <laughs> Your noble highness. A clever fellow like the Medici for whom Machiavelli is writing the book is going to see through the introduction but then wonder, do I want this guy on my side or do I want him on someone else's side? This is a very difficult thing to consider, a difficult concern for a real prince. Look at the examples that we get in, the, in Machiavelli's The Prince. He gives examples of how to take over countries that you are born to. For example, if your father is the king and your, fa and your, your father dies, how you take succession there, very easy. The people will accept it. You, you won't have any problem with them. And when you are trying to establish your rule as a new ruler, in this legitimate government, the best thing to do is to establish fear, because you can count on fear. Machiavelli says it would be very nice if you could be loved. L having being loved by your people, by your subjects, is a very handy thing for a ruler. And Machiavelli says it's not that love is intrinsically good, but rather that love is handy and practical, and if your people love you, they're less likely to give you a problem, so you should cultivate love. Now, love is, is a nice thing to have, but Fear. Fear is the kind of thing Machiavelli really understands. He likes fear. Because fear is one of those things you can count on. And if, as Machiavelli points out, you are forced to choose between having the people love you and having them fear you, make sure you have them fear you, because you can count on fear. People's love, eh, you never be sure enough about that. But fear you can count on. So it's important to be feared. The next best thing is to be loved. The only thing the prince must avoid, according to Machiavelli, the prince cannot afford to be hated. When the people hate you, they will come and get you. One way or another, they will depose you. And the whole name of this game is to take power and to control power and to make it your own and then to absorb more power. There's a part in which he says, well, it's nice if you can inherit a kingdom from your father, if your father happens to be the king, but very few of us are lucky enough to have that circumstance. Now, you must think back to your head that, in your head that Machiavelli's father was the pope which is a very handy circumstance. It's just the problem is you, you can't get to the papacy by hereditary succession, so we have kind of a difficulty there. Yeah, they've been careful about that. Well, Machiavelli says, if you don't happen to be born to the throne, if you don't get the royal purple by matter of birth, there's always usurpation, which is a great favorite activity for him. He really likes usurpation. So the idea of getting close to the throne, of gradually weaseling your way into the court and telling of course, the king or the prince or the legitimate ruler, how much you admire him and how well you think of him and how important it is to constantly be pursuing Machiavellian political policies, the more you'll become important, indispensable, the more you could stab him in the back and take control of the government yourself. Machiavelli's moral universe is the moral universe of the wolf, of the predatory animal. Machiavelli and his political philosophy has a horrifying brilliance to it on account of the fact that it's consistent with much of what we see in political life on an everyday basis. The drawback of this conception of political philosophy and the concomitant conception of an amoral universe is that it makes people no longer social animals. Stop and think about what the Machiavellian wants us to do. He wants us to constantly betray others both above us in the political structure and below us in the political structure in order to satisfy our own lust for power a lust which is never satisfied and which only grows bigger and bigger as its objects become bigger and bigger. That's one of the reasons, incidentally, why Machiavelli likes Roman history so much. Roman history is full of creatures like this. Machiavelli thinks they're wonderful. He thinks that the Italy of the 1500s, 16th century Italy, is feeble, uh, prostrate, broken up into fragmented, warring little cliques that prevent real political glory from coming into being. The reason why he likes a horrifying figure like Caesar Borgia is that Caesar Borgia is the man of virtu, V-I-R-T-U. Virtu is exactly the opposite of platonic virtue. It is much more like Thrasymachian virtue. It is the virtue of the man that tells lies, that stabs people in the back, that does whatever it takes to satisfy his unquenchable desire for power. So what we need is a man of virtu, and this book is designed to create virtu. The problem is that this virtu is the virtu of the predatory animal, not of the rational human being. Or it's the rational human being insofar as that rationality is completely subjugated or 
subordinate to one's irrational desires. And if you stop and look back at what the soul of the, of the tyrannical man was supposed to look like in the Republic, you realize that the desiring part is really running the rational part. The rational part of the soul is just an instrument in the hands of his desire for power or sex or money or what have you. Machiavelli takes that same conception of the soul. Desire comes first. My desire for power determines all my other activities, and my rationality is subordinate to that. So Machiavelli wants us to have that kind of virtu, the virtu of the leopard. The, the guiltless killing of the hawk. The hawk doesn't feel bad about killing sparrows. That's the way hawks are. The way of nature is the way of cruelty. We must learn to live with that, or die with that, if you get, if you get your way through Machiavelli. Now, excuse me. Now, let's come back to the problem of Italy. Italy is fragmented. Italy is broken up. Italy is in a historically horrible set of circumstances. And Machiavelli is sounding a clarion call to break through from old ecclesiastical borrowings, old scriptural conceptions of virtue, old uh, Greco-Roman conceptions of morality. What Machiavelli wants is a good practical politician that will scheme and lie his way to the top. And once he gets to the top of a particular Italian city-state, he will attack one city-state after another and unify Italy and create something like a new Roman Empire. There can be new glory, a new this-worldly satisfaction of the potential for human greatness. Remember that Machiavelli is completely opposed to all metaphysical interpretations of the world. Machiavelli does not believe in heaven and hell. Machiavelli does not believe in God. Machiavelli does not believe in the realm of the forms. All Machiavelli believes in is here and now. The main chance, how are we going to get what we want right now? And Machiavelli's conception of Vir II, of the blessed human condition, of the well-organized human soul, and of the practically run political society, all come together in this figure of the ruthless, tyrannical prince. Now, this tyrannical prince will be, as Machiavelli says, like a lion and a fox. When he's faced with military dangers or threats that are direct and obvious, he's a lion. He can withstand anyone else's direct coercive force because he's a military man. Machiavelli likes blood and gore. He's a very military kind of fellow. He really likes military solutions. But in addition to that, being a, uh, being a lion is not enough. In addition to that, it's also necessary to be a fox. What we mean by being a fox is that one must be s clever, sly, cunning, deceitful. And when you're powerful and at the same time deceitful, when you can confuse them, when you can confuse your opponents and defeat them in a practical, coercive sense, then you are the man of real virtue. This is the kind of guy that's going to go straight to the top. He's going to climb a pile of corpses on his way there. But then again, he has no moral compunctions about it. There is no God to judge him. There is no metaphysical standard by which to judge this. He either succeeds or he doesn't. It's a sort of nihilistic approach to politics in which the gratification of the individual ego is raised to the status of a principle. In some respects, this is why the Renaissance, and particularly the, the, the human-centered political science that's characteristic of the Renaissance, which is a big change from that of the Middle Ages, is such a turning of the corner in the Western political tradition. We're moving away from God-centered politics toward man-centered politics. And man-centered politics is ugly, man-centered politics is bloody, and man-centered politics serves no ends but human ends and human desires. There is no ultimate summum bonum, no ultimate good that politics gestures at. Machiavelli gives a very fine example of, a, uh, of an action which he considers to have great political wisdom in it. I think you'll like this. There was a ruler who attacked and conquered another city-state, but there was still a great deal of banditry, a good bit of outlawry, uh, political chaos in the countryside. So this ruler, and Machiavelli thinks this ruler is a very wise fellow, he sends his second in command, his lieutenant to that city, and he says, I give you complete power of life and death over all the citizens of that city, because now they're mine. And I want you to go down there and lay down the law. I want you to ruthlessly exterminate all of my enemies. I want you to, sell, to make the decrees I think appropriate, and whatever decrees you think are appropriate, make them all and lean on these people. Go in and coerce them, intimidate them, frighten them, until they concede that I am the legitimate ruler here and that you rule in my name. And I give you complete power. If any of them complain about you, tell them I have given, delegated my authority to you, and if they give you any more problems beyond that, kill them. Now, that, that's only half of the story. There's more to it. After doing that, 
the prince lets this guy do it for a couple of months, three, four, five months, and this very cruel, very bloodthirsty, very ruthless second in command dominates the people. Lots of mass executions, cruel tortures, horrible bloody spectacles which frighten the people there out of their wits. Now here's a problem. This is part of Machiavellianism. Fear is a good thing. You can count on people's fear, and this guy's made him plenty afraid. But we have a problem here, the potential for hatred. Certainly, if you've killed someone's father, mother, son, daughter, husband, wife, it's going to be payback time. Machiavelli has no conception of forgiveness, no idea that charity ought to be extended to us sinners. He thinks that's for children and old ladies. No. Machiavelli says the right way to handle this is the way the prince in this case handled it. He went to that second city, and he asked the people in that city, well, what do you think of my new ruler here? Isn't he a nice fellow? A real charmer, isn't he? And it turns out that the people were horrified by the terrible cruelties, the tortures and the murders and the public executions that he had imposed on them. So secretly, that night, the prince is sitting back there thinking about this, and he orders his secret police or his private guardsmen, the ones he can really trust, whoever they are, tells him, I want you secretly to go to the room of my second in command, the man I gave this bloody authority to. And I want you to take him out to the center of the square of this town. And I want you to cut him in half and leave him there. Next morning, the people of the town get up. And what do they see but a man who is the object of intense hatred to them? Pieces of him all over the center of the square. And then our prince sets out a decree that he had heard through some source, which he isn't going to name, that this man had been very severe and very violent, and we can't have any of that in a well-run state. He had heard that this man had usurped power that the prince had never given him, and because the second in command had been so bloody-minded and such an evil, cruel fellow, the prince's justice, the prince's mercy, and the prince's, prince's honesty required that he be cut in half. The art of the double cross. You send a guy out to do the dirty work, you cut his throat, you throw him to the wolves, you give him to the people that are left over, and then you clean up the gravy at the end of it. This is Machiavelli's conception of good politics. He specifies that particular example as an example of a man who really knows his way around political stuff. First you, first you conquer a people that you have no right to, and then you send somebody out there to do extremely evil and unpleasant and violent things to them, and you lie to him and say that you do it with my blessing, and then you go to the people and you act like you're blameless so they won't hate you. And then you kill this guy, throw him to the wolves, and the people lap it up and say, what a nice fellow you are. Glad we got a prince like you. Much better than the guy we had here. We thought he was acting with your authority, but of course now we see that he wasn't. That's what the word Machiavellian means. Two, three, four levels of meaning. All devoted to the same task. To the organization and acquisition of political power by any means necessary. This man is not careful about the means that he uses to achieve his ends. So Machiavelli writes his prince 90 pages in order that a practical politician can have this around for inspiration. And isn't it inspirational reading? Those of you who have looked at it before will find that, like it or not, it is in some respects inspirational reading simply because of the single-mindedness, the ruthless pursuit of practical political power. As a handbook for doing that, I think it has never been excelled. The difficulty, of course, with this is, is, as I said a little earlier, it prevents human beings from being social animals. Stop and think about it for a minute. Suppose you're a member of the Medici family, and suppose this guy, Machiavelli, writes the prince and dedicates it to you, and tells you to beware of flatterers, and beware of people that are trying to get in good with you, because you can never trust them, they may stab you in the back. Suppose you were a political ruler and he wrote it to you. Would you hire him to work for you? What would happen if you had him on your staff? First of all, your staff is going to start disappearing, right? <laughs> Unforeseen accidents. They're all going to start, as he moves up the ladder of command, bad things happen to good people. All kinds of stuff could happen here. And then, it may well be that some horrible misfortune may occur while you're out riding, while you happen to be asleep, while you happen to have your back turned. In other words, he is here so he can usurp your position. Why, oh why, if you had any brains at all, would you choose to have him on your staff? There is no man who is less appropriate to the staff of a politician than Machiavelli. And yet, in some respects, there is a lure. He does show you a horrible worldly wisdom, which maybe you want on your own side rather than on your other, rather than on your opponent's side. But if he's on your side, 
Well, I guess he really can't be on your side. I guess he's always on his own side, which is part of the problem. Machiavelli is not a team player. If you were a ruler, you would never in your right mind have him work for you. Turn it around. Suppose a ruler is foolish enough to bring a Machiavellian in. The Machiavellian kills him, makes it look like someone else did it. He takes over the throne. A person would have to be crazy to work for Machiavelli as opposed to have him work in, in in addition to having him work for you. In other words, suppose he were to become the prince or the king. What's he going to do with you when you become his number two or number three or number four man? You are expendable. Everyone is expendable to the Machiavellian. You have no intrinsic value except as a vehicle by which he can satisfy his desires, by which he can gratify his lust for power. So the Machiavellian soul is the tyrannical soul. In some respects, when you go back and look at Plato's Republic, almost all the great themes in Western political philosophy are to be found there. Machiavelli is nothing really new. Machiavelli is a codification, not quite a systematization, but a, a handbook for the would-be tyrant. He's a handbook of, it, it's a handbook of sophistry, right, because he says one thing and means another. And in fact, the meaning of his statements doesn't matter so long as it gets the practical result of achieving political power. And it's an entirely this-worldly orientation. If we had to look at the ancient political tradition, both Platonism and Christianity organized their political theory with reference to the will of some giant metaphysical lawgiver. In the case of Plato, it's the form of the good. In the case of Christianity, it's God's omnipotence. But in either case, the key issue is making our behavior and our souls and our lives consistent with the obligations imposed by this thing in the metaphysical realm. Once we abolish the metaphysical realm, there is no law or ultimate standard by which to judge our actions and by which to judge our good and evil. And that means there's only the satisfaction of desires down here. And this leads straight to the sophist political position, that political power is an end in itself, that the satisfactions of people's desires is an end in themselves. And the real true state of human felicity is having profound, vehement, extraordinarily forceful emotions, passions, and then satisfying them. And the continuous satisfaction of vehement passions is what Machiavelli and the sophists and all of this cynical political tradition, cynical not in the literal sense, but in the broad general sense, this cynical political tradition enjoins us to. So all of you who are would-be rulers, this is the book for you. The difficulty is, is that it tells us all, or perhaps not all of us, but all of us who have the nerve not to succumb to metaphysics, who are willing to break free of the mold of mere morality, it tells us how to become chiefs and no longer Indians. And of course, if we were all to follow that, there'd be all chiefs and no Indians. But Machiavelli is under no illusions about everybody having the capacity to do this. It's only the extraordinary individual, like himself, or like Caesar Borgia, or like a handful of the other great tyrants in history that have really shown us what human beings are capable of. In some respect, Machiavelli is similar to Plato in that both Plato and Machiavelli are trying to show us something buried deep in the marrow of the human soul. At the very center of it, Plato thinks there's an eternal goodness, a final spark of the divine soul, which allows us to get some access to the mind of God and to the understanding of ultimate truth and wisdom. Machiavelli believes that at the core of the human soul, in the marrow of the psyche, there is a beast, an untamed animal, which wants only the satisfaction of its desires. In some respects, this is a very prescient theory because it anticipates many of the views that will be later be held by Sigmund Freud. Underneath our superego, underneath this veil of civility, this veneer of righteousness. In fact, we are animals exclusively concerned with the satisfaction of our physical desires. We are beasts with a very, very thin shell of rational morality. Machiavelli suggests that we should become on the outside what we are on the inside, except in such cases when it's inconvenient. If it's convenient to look pious, gentle, kind, and good, well, that's just fine. The important thing is not to be gentle, kind, and good. The important thing is to be ruthless and rapacious and treacherous. If you are familiar with uh, the play King Lear, the Edmund and Edgar characters, particularly the, uh, the bastard son, I think it's Edmund, 
gives a wonderful speech in which he talks about legitimacy, in which he talks about the order of political right and the circumstances of inheritance and social status. And when he says in the beginning of that soliloquy, thou nature art my goddess and to thy law my services are bound, that prayer was about the only prayer that Machiavelli could say with a straight face. Nature, red in fang and claw, is the goddess to whom his services are bound. Nature, which is the fundamental reality. We are human, physical things. That's, remember, where that's where the word nature comes from, from the Greek word phusis, right? So we are physical beings. We are not spirits in a material world. We are rapacious bits of meat that do whatever we can to take advantage of each other, except when we're deluding ourselves with things like morals, religion, kindness, gentleness, milk of human virtue, that sort of thing. But apart from delusions like that, and silly poetry appropriate for the feeble, the weak, the Christians in life, there's only blood, gore, power, the intoxication of not only surviving but conquering. We might say that Machiavelli's conception of virtu harks back not to the Socratic conception of virtue, but to the conception of virtue characteristic of Homer in the Iliad and the Odyssey. It's the lying, treacherous virtue of Odysseus. It's the powerful, lion-like virtues of Achilles. If you are a good warrior, able to coerce other people, able to impose your will on a universe that is both indifferent to you and indifferent to any moral structure you might create, then and only then are you a man worth taking seriously. He enjoins us to create, to go back to the earlier pre-Socratic, pre-Christian virtues. We hear the drums of a primitive heroism in this book. It is a blast from the past, and at the same time, it is one of the most modern of political works. If we take for granted, and I think it a fair assumption, that at this point in time we live in a secular age, we live in an age which is contemptuous of metaphysics, which is contemptuous of references to abstract morality, then in some respects we live in a Machiavellian universe, even if we have some sort of atavistic connection back to an earlier morality that meant something more than personal self-gratification. In that respect, Machiavelli is a very modern political thinker. He is the first political thinker to break from that metaphysical tradition towards a completely physical tradition, to move from a sacred politics to a profane politics. Or you might say that he undoes the distinction between the sacred and profane by abolishing the sacred. So the world around us is neither sacred nor profane, it just is what it is. And you are what you are, and what you are, in fact, is a wolf guarding the sheep. If you remember the analogy that Thrasymachus makes in the first book of the Republic, that the ruler relates to the citizens that, he, that are his subjects the way a shepherd relates to a sheep or to a flock of sheep, he keeps them there, not because he likes the sheep, not because he has any moral obligation to the sheep, but because he likes pork, he likes lamb chops. He likes to turn these things into his sustenance. Well, other people, the subjects in the Machiavellian state, will exist only in order to satisfy the physical, carnal, carnal is a well-chosen word there, carnal desires of the Machiavellian prince. Achilles might have liked Machiavelli if he had understood what was being said. Odysseus, I think, certainly would have liked Machiavelli because he brings together both the lion and the fox. I would say not so much Achilles, because Achilles is a little on the dumb side, but Odysseus, as the perfect Machiavellian hero, brings together the willingness to lie, the willingness to violate oaths, the willingness to break whatever social conventions are around you in order to achieve your ends. The centered, focused, fierce desire to satisfy your innermost longings. In some respects, Machiavelli is what people would be like in the Freudian sense if you took away the superego altogether, or if you only kept the superego, the conception of righteousness, of moral virtue, as a veneer to protect you from other people's condemnation. But what we are down deep is a mass of desires that we neither choose nor control and human felicity simply exists in the satisfaction of these desires. Oxen are happy when you give them straw. Machiavelli is happy when you give them a government. Fundamentally, there is no difference. Each animal gravitates towards its own appropriate object. Machiavelli, in that respect, is, the, is an ancient political theorist and at the same time a modern political theorist. He represents nothing new in politics, but rather 
an ever-present temptation. It is always tempting for human beings to take the easy way out and decide that they're going to be meat, that they're going to give up the attempt to kindle the divine spark, which is what Marcus Aurelius called the soul, called the disposition to moral virtue. Machiavelli doesn't want to climb what Plato called the ladder of beauty in the symposium because he finds the world ugly, violent, and evil, and he likes it. So, in other words, not only does he know that he's in the cave, but he thinks that any attempt to move out of the cave is a kind of letting down of nature. It's an attempt to move away from nature towards some sort of chimerical, poetic, I know not what. And Machiavelli is, the saint, is a patron saint of all politicians who would be exclusively and immorally practical. One of the great difficulties in evaluating Machiavelli is to give him his due, in other words, to be intellectually fair, fair to him, because he is a great genius. There's no way that we can honestly take that away from him. But it's also a mistake to say that while he's a great genius, we can, in practice, use this as a guide to life. If people were to take this seriously, and although God help us, some of us do, it would be a disaster for the social structure and it would be a disaster for politics. The difficulty is, is that we seem to vacillate between one and the other. When the better angels of our natures take over, we can see how Marcus Aurelius is a fine politician and how Plato offers us something real, solid, substantial in organizing our emotions, organizing our lives, organizing our standards of judgment. The problem is that we tend to vacillate back and forth. Every once in a while, when we think nobody's looking, we have a sneaking suspicion that Machiavelli may be right. Let him who is, out, who is without sin cast the first stone. I think every one of us has done stuff that we knew was wrong at one time or another. Machiavelli is saying, I wish to liberate you from the guilt of thinking that that is a mistake. Your mistake is in not doing that all the time. Do not succumb to the temptation to be an angel. You have no chance of doing that. You are meat. You are meat with a rational soul, but your rational soul is nothing that glows in the dark. It's nothing metaphysical. It's just the rational part of you that allows you to decide how to best satisfy your irrationally developed desires. So Machiavelli is a kind of standing temptation. He is a great political genius, and we must give the devil his due, almost literally speaking. But at the same time, we have to understand the limitations of this. Limitation number one is that it prevents us from being what we really are, which is social animals. A Machiavellian would be unfit as a subordinate and would be unfit as a superior. Nobody in his right mind would work for Machiavelli or have Machiavelli work for him. Number two, it is a, a denigration in some respects of human nature. It is a cynical analysis of what people have done in worst case circumstances. It is almost an entirely hopeless philosophy. By rejecting the Christian virtues of faith, hope, and charity, well, I suppose we might get by without charity. I suppose in this case we might get by without faith. But the problem with this philosophy that I think even bothers those who acknowledge its brilliance is that it is an entirely hopeless philosophy. What can we expect from the next government? The same thing we can expect from this government, which is that it will be rapacious, that it will be treacherous, that it will be evil, and that it will be powerful and that it will dominate us. The only way out of that merry-go-round is to dominate everyone else. Nature, red in fang and claw, enjoins us to make a meal of our own, enjoins us to become the wolf among the sheep. And if we have both the inclination and the unwillingness to philosophize in the platonic sense, then it seems to me that the only logical conclusion is the one that Machiavelli draws. So if you wish to go for the strictly physical, strictly anti-metaphysical politics, we're going to have a hard time connecting politics and ethics. One of the great achievements of Plato's Republic is that politics turns out to be ethics writ large. That what is good for the soul of the individual man, the organization of the reasoning, the spirited and the desiring parts, it also turns out to be isomorphically good for the society. Because we will organize the rulers, the rational folks at the top of society, who will have the guardians or auxiliaries, the spirited part, and we'll have the bronze people at the bottom, getting as many of their desires satisfied as possible. For Plato, there's a one-to-one -one connection between politics and ethics. That will be true of all the metaphysical thinkers, also be true of the Christians. On the other hand, 
If one wishes to adopt the single world, entirely physicalistic interpretation of human life and of ontology and of politics, of necessity, there will be a disjunction between politics and ethics. We will hear this again when we deal with David Hume's theory of justice. So if you wish politics to be moral, if you complain that politicians take too many bribes and cut too many corners and are unwilling to do what they ought to do and meet their moral obligations. You are implicitly making an argument which is founded on some sort of metaphysical conception, no matter how inchoate. You might as well fess up to it now. <laughs> You're all metaphysical believers. If you don't wish to be a metaphysical believer, that's another possibility. Be careful you don't move down the slippery slope to Machiavellianism, because we move from the state of society to the state of nature, and the nature that Machiavelli has destined for us will be worse than any hell because it'll be immediate and tangible and there's no way around it. It's a necessary element in the human condition. Machiavelli offers us a secular substitute for salvation. Machiavelli offers us a chance for this worldly gratification and since there's no other world for us to go to, no final judgment of God, no ultimate moral order, this is the best that the human species can attain. The Homeric virtues, the military virtues, the treacherous political virtues, those elements of Roman history which are the most disgraceful and the most appalling, Machiavelli wishes to raise those to the status of universal human felicity. An unusual, well perhaps not an unusual, uh, a necessary but lamentable temptation. And insofar as we wish to avoid that, we must go back and think about the idea of politics and ethics, the implications that it holds for ontology, because it implies a metaphysics, the implications that metaphysics have for our conception of the rest of philosophy and the way in which knowledge holds ethics, virtue, and human experience together, the way it connects our conception of the individual soul and political order, and the way in which our own lives would be influenced by a decision to either succumb to the lure of this world or to take the chance that another better one awaits us. It is not a decidable proposition. Machiavelli wishes to offer us one possible solution to this set of intellectual difficulties.